Self-knowledge, says Jane Austen, is the first step to maturity. Well, I don't know how mature I am, but I'm willing to take a few steps towards self-knowledge because I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Interlude, what is The Jewish Story? So I'm sitting here at the end of a very long road. Those of you who have been listening for a while know that we've come to the end of season three. From the book of Daniel to 1948, thousands of years of history, and I have to tell you, I'm feeling both awed and worn out. And I thought to myself that we've gained a lot of people along the way. There's a lot of you, bless you, out there who have become fans, who become supporters, who are even boosters of the Jewish story. But many of you, I've never even met. And some of you have come along the way late in the games. So you haven't even heard the little bits and pieces I've let out about why the Jewish story is important. And last but certainly not least, not a few of you have asked that I engage somebody to start asking me questions. So in light of all the above, I've decided that here in that space in between, because season three is coming, but I need a little bit of breather. In that space in between, I've brought in our very own beloved, much honored and highly contributory. Those of you who don't know, I of course didn't create the jewishstory.co website, nor the Facebook page there at Jewish Story Podcast, nor the Twitter, nor frankly, the logo or anything else of real graphic significance. That's all been the man behind the scenes, Eitan Ben Avraham, my dear friend and co-conspirator here on The Jewish Story. Hi, Eitan. How you doing? What's going on, Rev Mike? So I want to try something. I've never done it before, but I feel ready that all those steps towards self-knowledge and maturity, I'm going to hand the mic over to you. So what I want to do right That's now- That's a huge sign of trust. Well, you know, it's a little bit, makes me nervous. Plus my name is Mike, so the symbolism Mike there. Mike behind the mic. You know, well, well, not anymore, because here, ready? One, two, three switch unbelievable i feel a little bit strange you're in the other side of my head in the recording uh earphones but nonetheless i think we can do it so i want to hand it over to you and you take where you will okay so so the reason that we just did this switch is because you know the way i would call this the soul of the show is what is the jewish story and who is mike mike foyer or, i can't separate them in my mind or who is mike foyer and what is the jewish story actually that's a really important thing to be able to separate those things because you from know a branding perspective just let, or just like no a from a psychological perspective like in the same way that like you know you might really really love someone but like you might not like their cooking right right and then if you don't like their dish they think you don't, don't like, like them. them well right? I, you know this would be a big step of maturity for me i have to admit that the level of identification between myself and my content right now is mm -hmm. perhaps a little too close right so that's what so then this interview is going to be a good thing because that's what we're going to get into is who you are and really i just want to like i just want to get to know you and so really let's just let's just start with the basics of like where are you from where am i from yeah so i grew up in cleveland ohio wonderful place it is great jewish community i went to public school my whole life all the way through grad school, but strong Jewish identity. I was in the conservative movement, big C, because um, they are all liberal, little L. And when you um, say, when you say like in the conservative movement and strong Jewish identity, does that mean like you went to a Jewish school every day or you went to Hebrew school every week? No, I went week, to public school, or, as I said, but right. I was a Hebrew school kid. Um, so you went to Hebrew school after public school? After public school, twice a week, plus on either, you know, Shabbat or Sunday. And, you know, I was a survivor in the sense that I actually enjoyed it, at least in my later years. Because you know what they say about the Hebrew school system, that two generations of Hebrew school did more than a thousand years of missionaries could achieve. I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are very broken in their relationship mm -hmm. to Torah through Hebrew school, but I was not one of them, thank mm -hmm. God. I also went to Jewish camps, two shouts out for Ramah, which mm -hmm. was an amazing part of my life and mm -hmm. continues, as I know from my own students, to be an important part of many people's lives. And I was in United Synagogue Youth. So you went to like a secular public school. Yep. Did you have non-Jewish friends growing up? Are you kidding? I mean, uh, my school was about 2,000 people. Uh, the big sort of um, split in the population was between African-American and sort of the white folk. It was about 50-50. Um, I played sports in school, so I had a much more eclectic group of friends than the average person, um, both crossing racial barriers and religious barriers and uh, social barriers. Um, I'm also a bit of a misfit in Nate by nature. Like, I don't like to fit boxes. In fact, as soon as I fit one, it starts to feel confining, and I deliberately tend to break it from the inside. That's why I'm either beloved or not much admired in institutions I've been part of. Um, so, yeah, yeah, my world was uh, was a, a very mixed So you were world. hanging out with Christians, you were hanging out with... Yeah, there weren't like... so many Muslims in our environment at that time. Uh, black Muslims, like mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of guys that I was actually, through the football team, reasonably close with. But, yeah, sure, America. Okay. 
So, and, and then also in terms of like culture, you know, because right now you're sitting here and you're wearing a kippa and you're wearing a tzitzis and you live in Mala Dumim and you daven three times a day. And sometimes you even lead the davening and you learn Torah all day long, but like, that's not how you grew up. Like you grew up in a high school, you know, I grew up in an excellent academic environment, in an intellectual environment, in the home that was always fueled by curiosity, um, and a sense of, of freedom and interest and engagement. Uh, also, you know, some good, solid, sort of like upper middle class values of success and achievement. You and know? your zone of culture was also secular culture, secular music, secular, yeah. all that stuff. I'm a child of the 80s in that sense, late 80s at least. I mean, I graduated high school So who, who who were you into growing up? Uh, I mean, I remember very clearly listening to the early run DMC tapes with my brother in the back of the car. Uh, when the Beastie Boys came online, that was like a big hit in my life. Um, oh gosh, who else? Music wise, I think, well, that's about... I also actually was was deeply deeply involved in reggae. In fact, I'm contemplating in season three doing the uh, the Rastafarian interlude. Interesting. Just to open up for people the fact that somehow out there in the hills of Jamaica, little nitsutsu, little sparks of prophecy came came leaking through, and how that could be is, craziness. Is, it is madness. It's total madness. Um, and so and so in terms of your Jewish identity, like if people asked if you were Jewish, you would have been like. Yeah, I'm Jewish. Oh, yeah. No, I was like kind of in your face Jewish. I mean, I wasn't like militant. I wasn't like wearing ki- a kippah in public school or anything, but but deeply proud, deeply attached. I had a huge chip on my shoulder against the dominant Christian culture. Mm-hmm. Always resentful of the fact that nominally America is a secular country, but in reality, it's a Christian country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like a minority. I really so, that, so, what, so what was experience. like, what was December like for you? Well, you know, I grew up in a world where they, we did, certainly didn't, sing Christmas songs in school, but instead, I remember growing up, I know a whole series of Halloween carols. Mm-hmm. I can sing you pumpkin bells. Mm-hmm. I can sing you songs about, about the great pumpkin is coming to town. I'm not joking, actually. All written, of course, by a Jewish choir master, but that's its, that's its own uh, funny issue. So it was, it, you know, the, the winter holidays, as we like to call them, were never my favorite time. At the same time, I loved putting my menorah out the window. Friday night dinner was like a well-known... Did you go sledding and get in snowball fights? Oh, sure. The only time, actually, I tell my kids we like to drink hot chocolate anytime it rains here in our fair country, that I can't drink hot chocolate unless I've actually been like knee-deep in snow and my toes are, are semi numb. Mm-hmm. And do you have any brothers or sisters? I have one older brother. He's about uh, two and a half years older than I am. Did you guys get along when you were growing up? Well, I mean, we were boys, so we like pounded on each other and drew blood mostly. Okay. Um, we, it, until he, <laughs> until he, until he left the house, and, really? and then the territorial issues uh, faded, and we actually became quite close once he was in college. Yeah, mm-hmm. but until then, no, no. And not only that, but he was a senior when I was a freshman. Mm-hmm. This is the way the years worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and his friends. I went to a school, like I said, of two thousand people. Very easy to get lost in some pretty scary corners where mm-hmm. we had on duty policemen in our school. Um, so, so uh, they used to deliberately misdirect me. My freshman year when I was trying to find a class, like, oh, yeah, go down to the end of that oh, hole, no. up those stairs. I, I find myself like in the boiler room as the bell rang in class. <laughs> Not only am I late, but potentially in danger, actually. Yeah, That's thanks, hilarious. Guys. Baruch Hashem, you made it. I made it. Trust okay, me, so you graduated from, you went public school your whole life, and then you graduated from high school? Yes, in 92. Then, in 1992. Good old. And then what happened? Uh, well, then the Rocky Mountains called. I actually, at the end of my high school existence, found God in the wilderness. I, mean, I grew up, like I said, in a, in a, a, I wouldn't call it a religious environment, but a, a, a environment that was conscious of its religion. Like and you knew you were Jewish. I knew it was Jewish. Like, and, I, and also, like I said, I went to, I was in the youth group. Did you keep and, kosher? Like, so we kept the kosher house. Yes. Mm-hmm. My mother, when I was around 10, decided to kosher our house under the um, auspices of the conservative rabbi. So, you know, there are, say, details that I differ with her mm-hmm. on how to run kosher, but I eat in her house. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. Uh, there's still a little bit of a dancing around that, but and what um, about like Shabbos and stuff like that? Like, so Shabbat, did, we did. We, you know, we were shamor, we were Zahor and not Shamor, as we say it. Okay. Sense, right. Meaning we 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 recalled the Sabbath day, but we did not keep it. Mm-hmm. So we would have Friday night dinners, which were legendary amongst my friends, Jewish and non-Jewish. Mm-hmm. D, like curiosity, questioning, raging. My my family likes to talk. Mm-hmm. I find that I can't surprising. imagine. That. You know, you get the four years together. My poor wife, the first time she spent the Shabbat with us at like 7.30 in the morning I'm, when I'm on my way to shul and having a cup of coffee and we're all like talking politics and roused up and she's like, mm. oh my gosh, who are these people? It's 7.30 in the morning on Shabbat. Different tribe. <laughs> yeah, very different tribe. So, so um, but at the end of my high school existence, I really um, 
We found God. I mean, we found God in the woods. What does that mean? Why wasn't God in Shul? What do you, like, what do you mean when you say you found God well, in the woods? Well, the Torah was in Shul, though I didn't really know what it was. And there was a lot of talk of, I don't even say about God. There was a lot of talk of God, you know, in, in, in Shul, although not much in Hebrew school. But in terms of an actual living presence in my life, which was sort of a pervasive environment in which I moved, that I found in the woods. Mm-hmm. I found in the woods when I realized that the birds... So, like, what were you doing, like, like high school's over, you started walking to the woods with your friends. Well, or at the you end went, of my high school, there was a club we had where a you went great camping. Thing called senior project in my high school, mm-hmm. which allowed you under certain conditions to take the last thirty days of of the high school and do basically whatever you wanted, as long as it was some sort of nominal educational focus. Mm-hmm. So my friends and I did twenty one days of backpacking in the Smoky Mountain National Forest down Whoa. in Tennessee. Yeah, we did the Tennessee side of the smoke. It's unbelievable experience. We did a seven day and a and a fourteen day loop. Um, 14 days on the trail is quite a bit. It's a lot of logistics and it's a lot of, you know, and that was a huge learning for me because it was the first time that we'd ever done that. But one of my friends was much more experienced and the rest of us, it was new. And, um, and you know, there's a rhythm which is available in life that only comes when you can wait to hear the birds sing before the sun comes up. And in my experience, without knowing that rhythm, you will always be somewhat estranged from the planet on which you walk. And since I'm a believer that this planet is one of the great blessings that the creator imagined, so then you're missing a deep, passionate desire that the creator has to connect with us. And so you discovered this on your senior project trip to the Smoky Mountains. Yeah, I don't know that I would have put it exactly in those words. But you felt it. I felt it, and then I headed straight to the Rocky Mountains. What does that mean? You didn't go to college? No, that's where I went to college. Meaning, I mean, I was, thank God, quite successful in high school and could have really gone almost anywhere between my academic record and my sports and et cetera, et cetera. In fact, my high school principal was deeply disappointed with my choice as he made clear to me, mm-hmm. as he also made clear to me that he could make me valedictorian if I would let him choose my classes. Hmm. Like, ew. It was that kind of place. Interesting. Um, yeah, it was an interesting place. Half my college, half my high school didn't go to college hmm. and, and the upper percentage went to the Ivy Leagues. Hmm. Um, so anyway, I didn't go to the Ivy Leagues, but I did go to college. It was the Colorado, Colorado College the foot of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado Springs. Amazing, amazing place. Really just good And like, why'd you choose it? For the mountains? Because, because or? when I went to visit, I got off the plane. And in those days, the plane, like there was no, you know, uh, what's it called? The tunnel docking mm-hmm. tunnel thing. Mm-hmm. I got off on the tarmac. I looked up and I said, here, mm-hmm. I want to stay here. Mm-hmm. And I like called my parents. I was ready to have them just send everything <laughs> out. And they're like, but you have to finish high school. You're not done yet. I'm like, but I want to stay here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, it was very, very clear to me where I belonged. Um, and I had four amazing years there delving very deeply into the world, into mm-hmm. the mountains. And that's also where you got into reggae, right? No, gosh, that's high school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Give a little shout out to Simon Walbaum, dear mm-hmm. friend who brought me into the world of Bob. But, um, the, the, so mountains, who were you in high school, in college? Like, who was I in college? A passionate environmentalist, mm-hmm. um, deeply engaged with the planet. I love to climb. My life was about rocks. I majored in geology the environmental mm-hmm. geology major um i spent a lot of my free time climbing mountaineering uh, backpacking mm-hmm. some biking although that was more of an avocation than and was there like a hill or a chabad on campus that you, you know college is one of those places where there's lots of jews but UJA, no jewish life you, okay there was some sort of uh, what was it called i don't even remember what it was called it was something so what did you do for the high holidays uh, the first year or two, I think I found somewhere to go. And then after that, I just let mm-hmm. it go. Okay. I just let it go. Okay. It was not relevant to me because mm-hmm. I had found God who was becoming ever more present. The more time I spent outside in incredible and in deeply challenging and therefore sort of self-revealing environments. I mean, there's a part of yourself that you come to know when you're hanging a thousand feet up on a rock face on equipment that you place there yourself which um, probably doesn't find so many other outlets in, mm-hmm. in, in modern day Western Like your life is actually in your hands. Yes. Yeah. This, for me, it's that nexus of awe and fear that expresses Yira, right? That, that, that the horizons of existence are suddenly so much bigger and the stakes are so much higher that the selfhood which emerges into them is, is fundamentally different. So I'm really curious and what I'm trying to do is fill in the blanks of how you know, your high school self and your college self eventually evolved into the present day self sitting in front of me. Right. But 
one of the one because I think that these are important things because they're also reflections of a of a of a state of, story of mind. I'm sure, right? You know, and also how you ended up really ultimately creating the Jewish story. Like this is ultimately a product of your own personal journey and I, your own personal yeah, thought process. Absolutely, it's more than a product. It's a shaper because you know, as everyone's heard me say a thousand times, I'm not actually interested in the past. I'm interested in the future. But in order to have anything intelligent to say about it and any sort of real dream of what it might be, I feel like I need to sort of like so it sounds like get a straight line on how I got here. So it sounds like you, like you generally speaking, you dive into things. So in high school, you were like diving into sports, diving into academics and college. You dove into sort of being out in the nature mountains. and the mountains and connecting to the rocks. And at, somehow I know in your journey that you ended up also like working with at risk youth, right? So that was after college before, um, I mean, I traveled for about a year after college because I made a deal with God that I would just go and he would tell me where to end up. It was a very fascinating year that didn't end perhaps how I expected any, to. Any, any points on the map that you care to share? Oh, there's lots of them, but I think that would take us too was far. Was it afield. like East or the Middle East? Oh, where did I go? Like I went to Australia. I went to Australia. My father, Olive Shalom, had mm -hmm. been there for a number of years and in business and it got me very excited about it. Plus, I was a sort of newbie traveler, and, and more or less, we speak the same language. So I thought it was a good place to start. Plus, you're right there on the door of Asia. Mm -hmm. where, and I ended up actually not going to the rest of Asia. I was in Australia for six months, and then I came back here to Eretz Israel. Um, I was down in the Sinai for a little bit. But um, this has always been my destination. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of whether I was ready to be here the way in which uh, the Rebbe Nash Olam. So, so, so after you graduated from college, you did this year of travel, and then you ended up in Israel. What was that visit like? Um, well, it was a bit of a what's sort of looking for nuclear bomb. <laughs> it was like, I mean, just to give you a snippet, I was I was living with an ex girlfriend who was a, a, a parliamentary assistant to Nomi Chazan. You know what Nomi Chazan is? She's the member of Knesset for merits, the mm -hmm. far left wing mm -hmm. uh, party. So it's like mm -hmm. living with this ex-girlfriend, going every day to the old city of Jerusalem to learn with my two, two of my best friends from high school who were in yeshiva in Eshe Torah. Mm -hmm. um, now I had a huge beard and like I looked like one of the yeshiva guys, but I didn't mm -hmm. wear a kippah. Little mm -hmm. kids in the old city used to run after me like, you keep her, you keep her, you keep mm -hmm. it off. Right? And, 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 and I still had the travel bug, so I was periodically just kind of like, leaving to go to the Sinai or to, to Akko or something. And mm -hmm. it was a little bit confused about what I was going to do, mm -hmm. let's just say. And then mm -hmm. in the end, I don't want to tell the whole story now, but um, he, he, I ended up standing with a uh, useless plane ticket outside the TW day office in Tel Aviv, having to make a decision about the rest of my life and just balked and went back to America. Mm -hmm. When you say useless, what do you mean? Oh, fine. In brief, I was traveling up to go to Akko and I was in the Tel Aviv bus station, and I got that sort of fear. I want to look at my ticket. It's an international traveling thing. Like, where's my passport? I just want to see my passport. Pulled the ticket out, and in, it was supposed to be booked for April 24th. Um, sorry, April 23rd. I'd send the money to my mom, and, and she sort of arranged it. Somehow it said March 23rd. And, uh -oh. that, and that day was March 24th. Oh, no. Yeah. So I called up TWA. Their first response was, dude, that plane left yesterday. Sucks to be you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen. I went down there and like begged and pleaded with this woman. You know, you watch a ticket agent. It looks like they're playing Pac-Man, mm -hmm. right? They're just like, she's like, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Bing. She's like, okay, if you give me $400 right now, I can reserve you a, a ticket for April 1st. That was mm -hmm. all the money I had left. Oh, no. Yeah, I was planning to maybe go to, into the army or I was going to go into yeshiva at Pesach. I didn't really make a decision. Like, look where I was living, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, I can't make this decision in the TWA office in downtown Tel Aviv right now. I can't do it. I can't do it. Gave and then it, you did it. Gave her the money and just went home. Okay. Okay, so that was your first round with Israel. That was, well, not my first round, no, because I came here when I was, I was much younger and when I was 15 and really wanted to stay and go to the and army so and... And so this, this, but this visit also must have sh helped shape your Jewish identity, right? In terms of going to Asia Torah. Oh, well, and, and also like, what it means to get spit out of the land. Mm -hmm. Can you I say got a little bit? So tell, tell me both. Tell me about the awakening and tell me about the spitting out. Well, listen, it's a, probably a general principle in life is in order to achieve anything, you have to actually be the right person at the right time at the right place. So I was in the right place. I wasn't the right person and it certainly wasn't the right time. Well, did, I mean, listen, part of you was thinking about staying. So you must have had some sort of. Yes, but notice I couldn't decide what does that mean for me. Is that is staying a um, a delving into the world of the Torah and an absolute sort of inner devotion to the specific demands it makes upon my life? Well, is staying but you, joining the IDF and ignoring that whole world of Torah and you know I don't know, maybe getting back together with my old girlfriend and 
pursuing down that path. Okay, but but you know, want to know what? Apparently, you encountered something that you never encountered before, right? Oh, a major choice I wasn't willing to make. No, but <laughs> but 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 that choice was based on something, right? So so what I'm asking is like, what did you encounter? In this year, in between graduating from college and starting ah, your sure. groove, oh, that as... I can tell you very quickly. What does it yeah. mean to be home? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be home? I mean, I grew up in Cleveland, like I said, but you know, my grandfather was a, a stowaway immigrant who escaped from Europe in 1937. So the fact that my family's from Cleveland is circumstance, right? And and, and I, I love America. I felt very attached. I'm very I'm very proud of my American side of my identity, but it's not where I'm from. Mm -hmm. But am I from Romania? I mean, like that's where my grandparents were from and i sort of empathize and 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 uh and connect very deeply with the ashkenazi story as people have been hearing me tell a true story have probably sensed you know all along but i'm not from poland or romania come on i don't speak any of those languages and there been these places you know and so but every time i have entered the land of israel the minute my feet touch the ground i am at home Mm -hmm. now remember going home and was, so that's what you felt with your big beard without a keeper. you were like well of course i felt home because like i said it wasn't my first time here the problem is is that when you're 15 years old and you come home everybody loves to see you mm -hmm. you're always welcome oh he's just 15 he's doing this he's doing that i don't know we won't get into what we were mm -hmm. all doing when we were 15 right but you know by the time you're 21 22 the expectations are different you walk into your parents' house at 21, 22, and you wipe your dirty feet on the living room rug. You leave your dishes in the sink, and, and uh, you, know, you make a bunch of noise at 2 in the morning. can't let your parents sleep. That's not okay. So this is a metaphor for you being here after college, and? You have to be the right person at the right time in the right place. I knew I was in the right place, but it was mm. not the time that I had the clarity of what type of person I needed to be. Okay, and but so I was pursuing parallel to... <laughs> Basically, Mike, I'm sorry, fans. but I'm going to, I'm just, I, I still, I want to dive in more. But so what about Torah as in, did you, did your headspace change? You grew up conservative. Did, did anything change or did you stay the same? Like Listen, you went, your, your friends I, were I, learning at age. I sat I was right? with them. And, and on one level, I could hear everything they were saying. Remember, I was the religious one in high school. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I was the one who had knowledge. I was the one who was much more committed to some form of, of mm -hmm. even ritual expression. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I couldn't help feeling that, um, what they were doing was a, a running from instead of a running toward. I'm not asking about your friends. I'm asking like, all right. No, so uh, it didn't penetrate. It didn't penetrate. I heard it. It, it. it made perfect sense to me, but it was all over there. It wasn't me. It's not who I am. Okay. So like you, so, so would it be safe to say that you didn't really connect to Torah on this visit? I, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question. I wouldn't say no. No, I don't think that's true because that's a very deep connective experience classes rabbis anything because that's that's what i'm trying to get um, no, at i was did also you, learning with my friends it wasn't it wasn't so a, so did you because because some people come to israel and besides connecting to Eretz israel and feeling home is, they also discover is, torah as a spiritual path well, this is my friend who was there who had a round the world ticket that he took when he was 18 his first stop was tel aviv he never left he's still here right and so that's what i'm asking is did you have a spiritual awakening in relationship to torah no okay <laughs> it gets there no Okay. Um, it was still over there, like I said. So, so it was like so love I, of Eretz Yisrael. I'm Jewish. I'm home. Well, just, but there wasn't there, like there's a, there wasn't like that. okay, that's it. I want to keep Shabbos, was, keep kosher. I want to that. learn Rashi and Tosfos and no, all no, that. Hang like on. that didn't it's, happen. It's important. What 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 did happen was that the volume on God went up extraordinarily when I came. But but there is there's a deep tension in what it is that God is asking of us as a people in our generation, and I I. Now that I look back, you know, I was a little bit wary of framing out my own life as a narrative. But now that I look back, I can see that I was sitting on the edge of that tension. Is that the sort of like the secular Israeli identity is a very important contribution to what God wants of Am Yisrael in the world today. With all of its warts and bumps and et cetera, that, that power of embodiment in the world, which is most powerfully represented by the IDF, by the Israeli army, right? I see a desire, a divine desire driving it. At the same time, the depth of the Torah and its engagement is also a clear expression. Okay, this is all but, great, but, but I, I want to I stay with on your, on your bio. So, like, at this, this point... Is, this, so, at this point, I left. Right. And um, I didn't want to put down any roots. I love the outdoors. I was involved in outdoor leadership for many years, um, both when I was in college and, and afterwards in private guiding. And so, uh, I found this uh, wilderness therapy program working with at-risk youth in the, mm -hmm. in the... Like you applied for a job, like you found a gotta, wanted... Gotta get a job, man. You gotta, gotta get a job. Mm -hmm. You gotta pay bills, gotta feed the people. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's not a choice. Um, and where I'll, were you at this point? 
I mean, I bounced around a little bit, um, and then I eventually went, as I was in the process of trying to find the job, went back to my parents in Cleveland. I was home for about three months. And then next thing I knew, I was in the woods of North Carolina for the next two years. And was it Outward Bound or something more? It's called the Eckerd Youth Alternatives. Um, it, it has a, a small element of the Outward Bound personal challenge, but it's, it's also got a little bit element of, uh, of, the, of other disciplines. It's really a, a psychiatrist named William Glasser whose structure they run. It's a collective living and, mm-hmm. and a resocialization process of mm-hmm. kids that are removed from and so society. so nature in many ways was your temple and now you're dealing with like young people who can't fit into so now it became society. a workshop mm-hmm. so now it became and a did you see transformations happen with kids absolutely no mm-hmm. question and with myself as well mm-hmm. now mind you this whole time my friends are still sending me letters from jerusalem like and books mm-hmm. i'm getting you know like msilat yisharim from my friends and i'm reading msilat yisharim in the woods of north carolina mm-hmm. right the path of the just for the people who are familiar with the english name and it makes sense to me. Um, mm-hmm. Reading, uh, you know, a couple of chapters of, of the Hebrew Bible every day, and and like I, I have a, a certain discipline that I've acquired already. Um, but and and getting to understand that there is a deeply broken side to America that, as a suburban white kid in Shaker Heights, Ohio, I actually mm-hmm. did see in my mm-hmm. own way because of the nature mm-hmm. of my high school, but didn't mm-hmm. really see. It wasn't real to me. And so and so now, who you are, like, is is feeling deeply connected to nature deeply connected to Eretz Yisrael Mm -hmm. um and living in a half frame canvas and pole tent in the woods of North Carolina so mm -hmm. completely rootless Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and and what I did was when I was finished I had applied to a graduate school program here in once again the land of Israel um which thank God I was accepted gave me a scholarship and a stipend and and that was it I finished out two years in the woods and said goodbye to America in my mind forever Mm mm-hmm my mind forever. That was it. There's no going back. Um, man plans. God laughs. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second time I was spit out of the land was because after about two, three months of grad school, my father died very suddenly. Um, many things collapsed for me at that point. I went home. I was home with my mother for about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the point at which all of the thoughts about the Torah that I'd been holding off, mm-hmm. um, I was able to give them space. Because, you know, on a certain level, the challenge that I held in my relationship to Torah is it's a really big ask. It's a really big ask, the lifestyle of the Torah. And so while I was happy and things were going my way, it spoke to me. But, you know, it's much more pleasant to just live a free life, mm-hmm. right? Um, or at least seems to be easier. Mm-hmm. Once I had already um, dropped the structure of my life. What do you mean when you say drop the structure? You mean after your dad passed away? After my dad passed away and I dropped out of graduate school. I wasn't working. I was sitting at home basically alone with my mom who worked. So, you know, mm-hmm. that was it. Like, so I had a couple of friends. So you were kind still. of like, you're, at this point, your life was kind of like a pile of rubble. My pile, my pile, my, yes, my life was a pile of rubble. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there were some, some deep de- bouts of depression in there. And I mean, a, a, the death of anyone is painful, mm-hmm. a shocking death all the more mm-hmm. so. I was very close to my father. Mm-hmm. And, and so therefore the loss was, um, put it this way, it took me a good 10 years to realize that what I've been dealing with, with this was the shock and not the mourning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and so that was mm-hmm. the second stage which came to me much later. And so I basically decided that um, I was going to rebuild from scratch. And I began to learn. Began to learn, began to pray. I was saying Kod- courses, local shul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, local shul. I was saying Kaddish to my father because mm-hmm. that became important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a wonderful rabbi at the shul, and the, and this like really sweet group of guys that he had gathered together. Who he was like a, it was like a breakaway man from a big Orthodox shul, and he and he was a you know working finance or something. They didn't pay him. He said the only way I'm going to agree to be a rabbi in this breakaway man is if you all agree to commit to learning together every week. Mm. So he had a chabur of guys who were more than happy to, to sort of draw me in um, and were sort of very sweet and directing and gentle about what I knew and what I didn't know and, and, and how to do it the way the Jews do. Um, and yet it was clear to me, shortening the story somewhat, that, that um, perhaps now I could be the right person at the right time in the right place. I mean, it was clear to you that you needed to be in Israel. Yes, that was clear to me. And, and you know, in So like your life, is, your life is in a state of rubble, you begin to rebuild. You start connecting on a deeper level to 
Torah and quote unquote Orthodox Judaism. You start connecting to these guys who are learning Torah every Which week. I would point out and, is in the essence, what it meant for me was the, the idea of the commandments as a binding practice, like the covenant beyond the covenant, because I think the covenant embraces more than that. Although I think you are correct. That's a central element of what it is. The commandments as a binding practice. Not the commandments as... I imagine you as, putting on tefillin when you say that. Yes, not the commandments as amazing spiritual principles or as avenues for relationship or as means of embodying the divine will in binding the Binding practice. A binding do practice. It. You're going to do it because you must. Mm -hmm. And everything flows from there. And so, and you know, the, the term that's often used in spiritual circles to describe that is surrender. Not in the sense of like um, quitting, but in the sense of... Of giving oneself over to. Yeah. Yes. So that for me was the Shavuot of that year. Mm -hmm. That was the... the you mean uh, like you had like an internal decision? That was when I made my decision. For me, every year, Shavuot is a time of Kabbalot, of, of mm -hmm. accepting things upon myself. And so you decided that Shavuot was to take on Halacha? Is that I what you're saying? I decided that Shavuot, the, the externally the expression would be I would start wearing tzitzit and a kippah mm -hmm. when I, where I was, wherever I was going. Mm -hmm. And that meant that I was now, I'm, I'm in. I mean, and I'm just, still just, ignorant of a lot, but mm -hmm. I'm in. So I just want to time out and zoom out for a second. So it's 2019. How many years ago was the Shavuot? It was the year 2000. It was okay. 19 years ago. Okay. Cool. 19 years ago. Um, almost 19 years because Shavuot of 2019 hasn't come up. So mm -hmm. Almost. You know, okay. A little more than 18. Um, and then I came back. Well, first I went to grad school. I was in, uh, I mean, I, I was in a program for sustainable international development based in Brandeis. But I found the program for a number of reasons. Brandeis is good if you want to learn how to be Jewish. Two mm -hmm. thumbs up. So you got good grades in college? Yeah, listen, I'm a learner. Okay. The the grade thing has never been a problem okay. for me. Um, the, the, uh, so it was good to be Jewish there, or easy and informative. And it was a two-year program, the first year in classroom work, and the second year abroad working on a, a master's thesis. Mm -hmm. So I found an advisor for my thesis here in Israel in order for it to be a bridge to get back here, not just as like, I'll tell you, when I went to grad school for the first time and I showed up down in this desert research station in, in Stable Kerr, you know where it is, mm -hmm. well south of Beersheba in the heart of the Negev. And um, I said to my professor, okay, what can I do? And he says, I don't know, what can you do? Mm -hmm. I was not ready for that. Mm -hmm. Which academically, mm -hmm. I was an achiever, give me the task, I'll, I'll give you, get the high marks, etc. But it's a very different stance on life when you actually have to figure out, well, but what but do you what want can to you do? do? Right. Yeah. yeah, so I wasn't ready for that at the time. I was much more ready for it the second time around um it was a very successful educational endeavor and got me here i mean that was when i moved here about you know 17 and a half years ago um so you made aliyah so you well, i actually came here without formally making aliyah i came here to do my project i ended up changing my sort of uh, legal status after having been here for almost a year so you finished grad school in israel yes yeah, so i wrote my thesis here and then became a citizen of israel yes met my wife and learned how to learn gemara which, and, which, as my master's and, thesis advisor said to me, is not possible in one year. <laughs> and that, and and that happened during your senior, your 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 second year slash final year slash senior year of your graduate. Yes, second year of my master's, mm -hmm. which was the year two thousand one, two thousand two. I got here um, a week before the two towers fell. And so, so tell me again what the master's was in that you ended up walking away with. What I, did you become a master of? I'm a master of sustainable international development. Interesting. Right, it's it's an MA. My focus was on water resource management here in the land of Israel. Water resource management. Yeah. So then, how did you end up right. in pa Pardes? <laughs> oh, I fell backwards into the Beit Midrash as soon as I got married. It was, um, you know, I, I I'm very passionate about the question of water resource management here for various reasons that lie off our topic. It was not a good time to be looking for jobs in that field when I got married. Uh, I had a friend who from yeshiva. I went to yeshiva my first year of marriage. God bless all those people. When we got married in America, we told people things that fold are easier to travel with. <laughs> wink, wink. Right? So, um, and then we proceeded to take all the money that we got in our first year of marriage that most people like use as a nest egg or, you know, buy all the stuff they'll have for the rest of their 20 years of marriage. We just spent it on rent and food for a year. Um, it was great. I mean, it wasn't that much money, but it was, you know, I went to Yeshiva. My wife was working very part time. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an amazing, amazing first year of marriage. And as part of that, I met someone who we shared outdoor interests. And he connected me to a, a person who was starting up a yeshiva who he wanted to do with kind of an outward bound type yeshiva um, who approached me for my outdoor skills. And I said, great, but I'm not done learning. And he said, wonderful, because I have my son. He's at the Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem and he needs a chavruta. 
So uh, we started, I learned, started to learn with his son and to, to run his program. And I got to do some amazing, amazing trips in the two and a half years that we worked together mm -hmm. here in the land of Israel. And um, I kept learning and suddenly discovered, like, this is what I like to do. This so, is really great. So Shavuos, about 19 years ago, you decided you're going to put on a kippah and sitis and, like, connect to, to Torah in a, in a, as a binding practice. Mm -hmm. You grew up um, conservative, strong Jewish identity, but not fully into Torah. Even when you came to Israel, it still didn't happen. So how did your relationship to Torah change during this time? I think part of it, and this segues nicely into the motivation for this conversation, is that coming to Eretz Israel, particularly at the time that I did, opened up the Torah for me as um, a grand narrative of creation, as opposed to just simply a, a document that people studied or a law book or, or the, or the story of our holy ancestors, but, but, um, and even more than the sort of classic blueprint of creation, the grand narrative that we're in a story. When I came here, like I said, a week before the tr World Trade Centers were, were destroyed, at the height of the Second Intifada, so-called, you know, the Oslo War, when, I mean, blood was running in the streets of Jerusalem and every other major city in Israel. I mean, there well, happened a couple of times that my then-girlfriend, now-wife, and I left places that were bombed an hour or so after we left. Um, and, and there was a sense of, of swirling crisis, of potential, of, um, of pressure and arc. And, I, you know, I carried a note from my great-aunt with whom... I was very close growing up. I was a survivor of Auschwitz. One of the first things I did when I got to the land of Israel was put that note in the wall from her. Mm. You Profound. Know? So, so carrying that element of my narrative, which I carry very deeply and not always in such a comfortable fashion. People who listen to the episodes on the Holocaust know that by now. Um, so the Torah opened for me in a way in which I had no idea of the depth, grandeur, this sort of... Um, sort of sometimes crystalline clarity and other times in sort of the intense fogginess of the world which it's attempting to birth. So so if you were to like, if you could go back in time or write a letter to your younger self that's hanging out in Cleveland. At what age? At, I don't know, 10, 12, 13, 13, yeah. bar mitzvah age. Uh -huh. And, and, and it's, if like right now, if you were to travel back in time and tell your 13-year-old self what the Torah is, what would you tell them? You know, I'm not fond of those types of questions. I'll tell you why. Because I don't think I want to mess with my 13-year-old self. Okay. I'm, I'm happy with who I am. But I understand the point of your question. I just wanted to get that caveat okay. out. As like, I'm, I'm not, not trying in order to, in order to, to reorder my life. I understand. Yeah. But it's important to me to express that. Okay. Um, what is the Torah? It's the story of your people. But it's not a passive thing that you receive. It's an active thing that you're called to embody. And so, therefore, whatever you do going forward, make sure it is who you are. It's the story of your people. Yes. And what do you mean when you say that? That, that um, we all have stories that are smaller than us. They're the stories that we tell, right? We tell about this or, or you know, uh, the, it's how we make sense out of the world, etc. Some of us are privileged to encounter stories that are larger than us, that call us to embody them. And, and the, the divine thought embodied in the Torah is, is a call to Am Yisrael to, to, to embody in creation the potential for a real relationship between creator and creator. Okay, so if you were to say that to your 13-year-old self, how would, would you say, say that? I would have said it that way. But My 13-year-old self would have understood it. You, you think, didn't know me when I was 13. Uh -huh. I was a very difficult child. So you were a smart <laughs> kid, too. Like, you would understand embodying Am Yisrael. One of my greatest the challenges as a learner has always been this sneaking suspicion I have that I'm smarter than my teachers. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a prohibitive in certain be, situations. Be, because when you say like being aware of a story part of, of that's bigger than yourself, you know, I think getting into you know what is the Jewish story, mm -hmm. right? And you say the Torah is the story of your people. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the connection there? Well, the Jewish story is an attempt to um, to to map out my understanding of how that narrative has played out in history. But when you say narrative, though, like, are you talking about Bereshit? Or is that where it starts? To start in the beginning? It starts before the beginning. I mean, the big unanswered question of Bereshit is why? Mm -hmm. What is it that God wants that brings us all about? Okay, so, 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 so the Jewish Story Podcast, jewishstory.co, you know, Facebook slash the Jewish Story Podcast. podcast. 
you know, all these things is ultimately a reflection of a question that existed before creation absolutely. that that you that that you that you're attempting in some way shape or form to answer oh absolutely that's like the super big picture no question not just to answer but to embody and i keep using that word okay because, so bring it down mike bring it down because because the way that we build a world is through stories we we, we don't just slap together brick and mortar we will build a house we build a home we don't just have biologically related people in a in a unit we have a family right and, and and if you've ever been a member of a family where you aren't biologically related but really felt that in intimacy so you understand what i'm speaking about in the same way listen all the post-modern historians will tell you that there is no such thing as judaism there's just these jews these people insist on calling themselves jews and this jew was different than that jew was different than this jew there is no essence right behind them that they are embodying in the world and i deeply disagree though i think that they're correct in many critiques because there's only one story and it's the story of love between creator and created but since there are an infinite number of human beings that story has facets upon facets upon facets and we as a people have the great grace of having been told that it was a story from the beginning we're told that you're in and therefore that gives you a consciousness and a and a power right to, to build bridges for that relationship and so this story started out in the past before time okay this story started out before time and at some point somebody came to consciousness that it was a story and started to write it down in our sacred texts whether it was joseph the tzaddik in egypt whether it was moshe at sinai whether it was ezra whether it was a committee i don't really care to be frankly honest with you to me it's very clear that that our blessings of people is our consciousness of the story right and insofar as we're able to sort of um do that dance of both pulling ourselves above the story to get the kind of like the god's eye view as it were but not taking the skeptical cynical approach that ah it's just a it's just a myth it's just another story and to be able to deeply immerse ourselves into embodying the story in the world and feel its power i mean you want to talk about the greatest story ever look out your window right i don't know if people heard the construction background in the no in, in the noise in the background there but, but that's binyan yerushalayim that's the building of jerusalem how did that come about because for 2,000 years, Jews told themselves it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You imagine telling the story that Jerusalem will be rebuilt in 14th century Rhineland, right? When the Black Plague has killed a third of the population of Europe and the Jews are being blamed for poisoning the wells. Oh, don't worry, son. Someday we're going to live in the rebuilt Jerusalem. Oh, thanks, Dad. Now I can go on. And lo and behold, lo and behold you and I complain about the noise of construction. You know, stories don't get more powerful than that. And we were at a point now, and this is to me what season three, I mean, I, I hate to like get overly ambitious, but this to me is what season three is about, is that we're at a point now that we have where to stand. It's time to move the world. Okay, but I, 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 I want to roll back a bit. Okay? You're always rolling back, man. I want to yeah, charge ahead. I know, but I want more black fire. So that's your job. So, so before creation into creation i know we're using very big words and very big terms but we're actually talking about a podcast that you can listen to and download right and and you and and you took us through a few thousand years of history up to the creation of the state of israel but at the same time that is going all the way back to this story and so why is the jewish story what separates why like is this a jewish history podcast or what's your angle what's your take on it what are you doing so what, what i'm trying to do is integrate the um sort of like the critical historical perspective which to me is very important there's a side of my selfhood um which believes very deeply in in the in the analytical critical power of the mind and the importance of information and data and and verifiability and replicability and all those wonderful tools that the western world has brought forward in the search for truth and meaning I, i'm 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 integrating that with a a deep attachment immersion in the torah as uh, um uh, almost a self-referential narrative right that, that the only way to understand what the torah is is to step inside that that you know the attempts at comparative religion and and uh you know critical religious studies are basically the equivalent of trying to figure out what life is by dissecting a cat. At the first stroke, you get rid of what you're after. So you may see a lot about the guts of how it came to be, but you'll never find the thing you were looking for. And so, and so how does that relate to the Jewish story? So I'm trying to do both. I'm, I'm constantly trying to turn up the volume on God in my life and, and hear in the here and now what the Rebbe Shalom is asking of us. 
demanding of us often, mm -hmm. pleading with. Even. And, and how does that and, relate to like a Jew living in America? Deeply, deeply immersed in in the critical sources as well of of how does the academic you know vision tell this or how does it relate to a Jew in America? Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a very important because God is everywhere, right? And and no matter where you live as a human being, you're part of the story. Call the Homer all the more so as a Jew, right? And and I happen to be a believer that. Um, while God might let the average non-Jew off the hook if they decide not to take up the task of moving the story forward, that the, the Jews don't have a choice in the matter. So you, want, so you want the Jews to know their story? Not just to know their story, to own it. Mm -hmm. And owning the story doesn't just mean knowing facts and figures. No, it means seeking to embody it in your life. And embodiment means? Means that how do you walk in the world? What are the values that you hold? What are the relationships that you build? What are the communities that you inhabit look like? And, right? what, and how does that relate to the Torah? That's one answer, how it relates to the Torah. I mean, the Torah is a bit of a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a mythic entity. Right, but you're, you're a Jew. You have a kippah and sitis. You're telling the Jewish story, all of these things, how you walk in the world, da 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 could apply have to sitis? anything. So you know how, does it, how does it relate to being a Jew? Right, well, but you know why I have a kippah and sitis? And why you have a mezuzah on your door? And why we both strapped ourselves with leather this morning and said, Shema Yisrael? Mm. Lest you forget lest you forget that there is something that God is asking from you right now. And so you want American Jews to know that God is asking something from you right Jews now. I want all Jews to know it. It just happens to be that I am in a position to bridge a culture mm -hmm. because I had the grace to be born in America, which I see as a tremendous grace, certainly considering my family's history, right, since that most of my family died in Auschwitz. Right? Um, I had the grace to be born there, and, and I've been blessed to come here. And, and, and so I see myself having an obligation not just by living my daily life where I do, how I do, raising my children here and, and forwarding the, the national project, but, but to reach out to all my brothers and sisters who, as far as I can tell, by and large, want the story. They're just not necessarily feeling attached to it because of their own background or the way it's being presented to them is often very either childish or demeaning or... Um, one-sided or et cetera, et cetera. There are many ways in which a story can be presented. And I, of course, have my own. And so, and so how do all these facts and figures relate to the Jewish story? The facts and figures of history? Yeah. Well, you have to weave them all together into a narrative that allows you to build an identity in the present, which is always based on your story of the past. But identity is future-oriented. What future is the past asking of us? And who do we need to be in the present in order to both understand it and actualize it? And you're speaking about this as a Jew, right? As a Jew, absolutely. Although it's an it's a it's a human, it's a human phenomenon. phenomena. But, but you, I'm a Jew, right? So this, and this is the Jewish story, this not the, the Jewish, human story. Right. Although I mean, there is obviously quite a bit of overlap between the mm -hmm. two, um, more so every day. Mm -hmm. And so and so and so it's an attempt to orient the Jewish people through the Jewish story. Yeah. Although I want to go back to that quote from Archimedes that I paraphrase, right? It's attributed to him at least, right? They, he said that if you give you where to stand in a lever, I can move the world, mm -hmm. right? And so we mm -hmm. talk about the Archimedean point. Give me a big enough lever and I can move the well, world. No, the key is he, you also have to have where to stand. I mean, mm -hmm. Archimedes understood that. And, mm -hmm. and, and so to me, Eretz Israel is where we stand and the Torah is the lever we use to move the world, mm -hmm. right? Now, now, does that mean a Jew in, in America can't move the world? No, that's not what I'm saying, but he'll always be striving to do so as an individual or at best as a member of a community, mm -hmm. right? The idea of having the leverage that a people mm -hmm. can muster, mm -hmm. that force is mustered here. So, so like, you know, before people do a mitzvah, like, you know, before they put on tefillin, like, they, they, they share their kavana. Right. Right? So, like, what's your kavana behind the Jewish story? Redemption. In the sense of telling a story in which everyone can find their place and that will strengthen their relationship to one another to creation and to the Bona Olam and motivate them to build the vision of what a, a healed future could look like. Okay, so now throw some more black fire on that and localize it to the Jewish people. Localize it to the Jewish people? We have to accept the fact that our past is not perfect. Right? This need, which I see as a need of the trauma of the last hundred years, perhaps since the destruction of the Second Temple, to um, present ourselves as perfect, flawless, guiltless, blameless, you know, um, God's chosen people better than sliced bread who are just inexorably wending our way toward redemption um, is understandable, but not getting us where I see us needing to go. So on one hand, 
they're just honest conversations that we need to have, especially in light of the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. That's one piece. And so, and that's like sort of the, the, um, facts and figures, the, the critical historical view that, you know, sure. don't always paint a beautiful picture of say, uh, how, you know, the pioneer Israelis behaved, you know, during the founding of the state of Israel. Or, you know, if you or, just listen to the last episode, how is it that Rommel and Lud are actually Jewish towns? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not what they were historically. Right. You know, or there's many more. Right. So you mean Jews aren't moral paragons of, you know, virtue? That's like one. I mean, you know, the by the way, expression. they never claim to be in the Torah or anywhere no, else. No, and but. that's one expression that, you know, the Jews are just like everybody else, only more so. Right. Um, um, but my point is not simply to burst bubbles and to, and to deflate our moral image. I don't think that that's effective. As an educator, I mm -hmm. can tell you that, that what you're going to get is not what you're after. Okay. If, so, if so you have this redemptive goal. So the other half of, of the story is to provide people with spiritual motivation and inspiration and, and a sense of the momentum that's gained from understanding that the story is bigger than us. So you're saying the past, the past is bigger than us. And so is the present. I mean, like I said, look around you, man. One of the great tragedies, my good dear friend Yishai Fleischer often points it out, one of the great tragedies that we face today is everybody wants to shrink it. They want to shrink it. They want to make everything petty, venal, small. Eh, Israel, it's not a miracle. It's just a state like any other. And look, they're even brutal. We're going to call you Nazis enough time that we do two things. We knock you off your high horse that you've had since the Nazis slaughtered you. And we reduce the Nazis to just another thing that we blame people for being. You understand how awful that is? It's a shrinking of the grandeur of the human project, of the divine project, of the potential of Am Yisrael. And, and, and I, I refuse that. And so, so look around through the eyes of the Jewish story and what do you see? <sighs> Ferment. I see the old world. You know, they say in the mystic tradition if, of many peoples that the seed has to rot in the ground before the tree can grow. And so what I honestly see is a tremendous, I mean, it's amazing, by the okay, way. Okay, but how is listening to your podcast going to help me with this ferment? Because the question, it, it, it's not a neutral act, what tree will strike out of this soil. Mm -hmm. We have an active element in that. And so how does your podcast relate to this active element? It helps you decide how did you get to where you are, who do you want to be, and where do you want to as go? As a Jew. As a Jew and as a human being. Because ultimately, the goal here is, is uh, shlema. It's, it's universal redemption. So you're we're, going for a big goal with this podcast. Listen, it's the only goal the Jews have. And, and insofar as we're focused on it, we will move forward. Insofar as we aren't. Listen, we have tremendous kochot. But, you know, like people love to send around that thing about the internet, about like how many PhDs or how many uh, Nobel Prize winning Jews, and etc. You know what? We can't claim any credit for that. Okay, so, so tell me again, like the world is in a state of ferment. 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 It's fermenting like kombucha. Yes. Right? But Bubbly, nonetheless. You know, yeah. which means things are rotting and falling apart. Right. And things are being born and bubbling up. Okay, and, and, and I'm listening to your podcast. And spiritually, what is your kavana in, in this time of fermentation and me with my earphones on listening to your podcast? Put the pieces together in a way which will enhance life. And, Which pieces? Not, the hist pieces of Jewish not history. Death. Not just pieces of Jewish history, the pieces of the world today as we see them. Right? One of the great tools of, the, of, of evil in our world is decontextualization. Mm. Is it, is, is, if, I can, if I can take apart how a thing came to be and just isolate it as evil or good or strong or weak, right? then I can tell you whatever story I want about it. What I'm trying to do is embed the present in its process of development, not to give excuses or, or, you know, sort of paper over the past. On the contrary, to free up our power to say, ah, that's how we got and here. And when you say present, you mean the presence of the Jewish people. Yes, but also humanity. In, humanity, I, like, I understand, but gonna, Mike, as in, listen, I'm holding the mic right now, okay? I hear that. So I'm asking the questions. And I'm and, giving the answer. And, I, and I'm asking the questions because I want answers. Okay. Okay. I just gave and, you one. And so, and so, and so I'm, I'm going in. And so when you say decontextualization is like a weapon is a very potent intellectual a very weapon, potent intellectual being, weapon i think right like so swung so, around so, as if it so were what i'm hearing right you now. say and it, it, it is that is that in the that part of your goal in this podcast is to allow jews to orient themselves in the context in which they find themselves yes it's to return our organic existence you know, philosophy might hang on a thread and, and be born out of abstraction, but anything real in the world has an organic process of formation. Okay, so tell me how history is going to allow me as a Jew to anchor myself 
and not just history, but the Jewish story. I mean, obviously, the most concrete example is in one's relationship to the state of Israel. You know, if you if you don't understand history, it's very easy to sort of judge the existence of the state of Israel according to certain sort of modern day philosophical or political or or you know cultural standards. And you know, the great example is the difference between a person who lived seventy years ago and looks at the state of Israel, and the person who was born in the last thirty years and looks at it is black and white. Because understanding the arc of our people's past, not just the suffering, the obvious need for a refuge. That, to me, goes without saying, although people forgot already. But in, in the sense of, what's our mission as a people? We've been wandering for an awfully long time. And what's the potential that we're being offered to build a better world and the fact that we actually have a place to stand together in order to do it? Oh, suddenly you see these Zionists who weren't just these rapacious colonialists looking to sort of like denude the natives of their riches. who are actually trying to redeem the world in a secular, perhaps, messianic fashion. But, you know, when Golda Meir wanted to bring, you know, water technology and agricultural technology to Africa, she said, it's part of my socialist Zionist vision to help fix the world. And, you and know, so this podcast is looking to fix the world. And I see the story as its primary tool. And functionally, why is history so important is because it embeds the present in the organic process of formation of the past. And that itself allows you to make honest estimations about the future that we want. And so, and so because decontextualization is such a huge weapon right now being aimed in so many different directions. Willy nilly. And just mm -hmm. breaking things. Breaking mm -hmm. things has become like a, a passion. Mm -hmm. for, for Deconstruction. The, yes. Yes. Is exactly what's happening. And, and um, it, while I indulge in my own fair share of it, mm -hmm. it, it, it and that's what the critical historical perspective is. And, Uh, and there is an important element in, in deconstructing mythology if it's not serving life. Mm -hmm. I'm making a judgment here. I'll be clear on that. Mm -hmm. I don't presume to have sort of um, the absolute truth, nor do I feel what I'm doing is neutral. I'm making a judgment about what parts of the stories are serving us and which parts aren't. And mm -hmm. the story I'm telling is one that I believe will bring life. That is our role in the mm -hmm. world. Bring life. But it's also, to, it's also to, it's, I mean, the word that keeps coming to mind is orientation. Yeah, for sure. Because there's two things. There's two things you can say for sure to go back to our question of the six days of creation. Remember, because I said there is no why in the book of Breshit. But the truth is, there's an implicit one and an explicit one. The implicit one is you can say for sure that God wants life. Otherwise, there would be nothing. So in which case, if we want to reflect God's will in the world, what we need to do is bring life. And as a people, that is what we've always chosen. Number two, the more explicit, is, you know, humanity is that element created in God's image. Correct? And what is God's first observation about humanity? It's not good to be alone. So implicitly we know that what God desires out of creation is not just life, but relationship. And if you think about it, that's what a story provides. It's a vessel that allows you to take the forces of life and shape them into a viable context for relationship. A marriage is a story of two. Now, you, you know, there are obviously more people involved, but the main characters, the, the thematic thread, is a story of two. What we're dealing with here as a people in our land is a story of a people, people in the land, people at the Torah, and ultimately, it's a story of creation. That's why I keep coming back to this also being the human story, although you are correct. I'm a Jew. I'm trying to tell the Jewish story. That's how I see my role in redemption. Everybody's so every time, it's like Rev Mike on the mic. So let's... So So it's like before we switch the microphones back, it's like so when Mike gets behind the mic and tells the Jewish story, where is he taking us? And speak to me as a Jew. Where I am taking you. Like I as a Jew am making this podcast. I am a Jew as I, I as a Jew am making this podcast and I am aiming to take you home. By which I don't just mean a small piece of real estate on the planet. By which I mean into the depth of relationship that is expressive of the original desire that led to creation, right? And in order to tie all the pieces together, that we can be human beings in our own right, that we can be a people in, in our land, that we can be a planet that's healthy and growing rather than undermining itself through rampant desire and deconstruction. In order to do that, we need a story. So when I get on the mic, I'm trying to tell that story that can bind the pieces together in a way which I believe will bring life.
And that ultimately will lead to redemption. I have confidence in that. Awesome. So maybe we should just switch mics one more time okay. and we'll wrap it up. So I want to say a few thank yous before we sign off. I want to thank Eitan Ben Abrams. It's just a wonderful, wonderful interview. And for a partnership, really a partnership. You've helped me enormously, not just now, as you know. And I want to thank all the people that give their hard-earned money to help make this show happen, to keep it free and widely available. I want to invite you to join them right now. You can go to jewishstory.co. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little button there that says, Be a Patron. You can click on through, give a little bit of per-podcast support. Now's the time between Season 2 and Season 3 to help me make history. If you've been a listener up to now and you want to be a contributor, this is a great time to do it. I want to also thank the Land of Israel Network for creating a platform that allows me to reach so many amazing people out there. That's thelandofisrael.com. I want to thank Pardes Institute for building a school that allows me to touch the hearts and minds of so many wonderful Jews. That's P-A-R-D-S dot org dot I-L. I want to invite you. Reach out to me now. Get me at Rav Mike at thejewishstory.cl. You can get me on Facebook at the Jewish Story Podcast. Hey, Rav Mike at thejewishstory.co. That's what I said, didn't it? You said C-L. C-L. Sorry. C-O. You're listening. Um, glad somebody is. Uh, now's the time. I can't make any promises, but if you let me know what you want to think about and talk about in season three,